Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to tell one trickster story, and I wanted to um, say a bit more about what this figure is, this trickster. So one thing they say is that the tricksters are ridden by appetite. They're hungry and horny. And one thing that interests me, the thing I'm trying to think about with these figures is the, their inventiveness, their creativity. I think the trickster has gotten a kind of bad reputation, but they, you know, they're bothered to have around, but they are also very inventive. And so some of this inventiveness comes out of the problem of being hungry all the time. In the coyote stories, coyote is always hungry. And um, this has two consequences. In some of the stories, he's uh, cunning and able to figure out how to get fed. In other stories, his appetites screw him up and uh, he gets trapped in some horrible fix or people steal his food or something. It's as if he has the belly but not the intelligence yet. But it's as if then the stories are somehow about a kind of intelligence that is needed to satisfy appetite. And so in Native American stories, the coyote is credited with having invented the fish trap. So that's the earliest trick. The earliest trick in the book is the putting bait on a hook to catch a fish. But then also the, these poor trickster figures get trapped. There are, other, there are monsters out there that eat them. <laughs> and so a second kind of cunning is the cunning to escape from the trap. If you're, if you're ridden by appetite and some other animal puts out a trap with bait in it, you're in trouble because you will get caught in that trap. So you need some intelligence about how to get out of traps. And so that's a second kind of intelligence that's connected to this trickster figure, connected to appetite. And uh, there's wonderful folklore about the coyotes. They say in the, in the West, when farmers used to try to get rid of coyotes and wolves and predators of all kinds, they would put out cattle carcasses laced with strychnine. And the wolves would come and eat these and die, but the coyotes figured it out and would stay away from the strychnine. So it's like they get wise to the bait. They uh, begin to talk amongst themselves and say, well, I saw that wolf die. And so, <laughs> and my best, the best uh, story about the coyote and these traps is they put out leg traps and you'd catch skunks and foxes and wolves and stuff. But it was uncommon to catch the coyote. And, and the one naturalist, I read a whole book on the natural history of coyotes. And the guy says, you know, it's hard not to have the sense that coyotes have a sense of humor. Because what they would do with, the, with these leg traps is they would uh, shit on them. <laughs> so that's a kind of a complicated relationship to a trap, <laughs> is to take a dump on it. <clears throat> So the story I'm going to tell is, um, it's like, where did appetite come from? And this is a story about raven. And uh, so in the North Pacific coast, the raven is, is a trickster figure. And there's, this is a Tsimshin story. And it's from before the new people came and when there were still monsters eating everything and before there was daylight. And in those days, the animals lived in tribes on the Queen Charlotte Islands. And there was a tribe of animals, the great chief and his wife, and they had a son who they loved very much. And the father tried to keep this boy from all harm. And in the back of the great lodge where he lived, he built him a bed high up. And the boy slept up there above his parents every night. And the father washed him two or three times a day. And he grew up, but when he got quite large, he got sick, and in a couple of days he died. And so the chief and his wife were grief-stricken, and the chief ordered his people to lay out the body of his boy in the lodge. And then he ordered them to cut him open and take out his intestines and burn the intestines at the back of the lodge. And the chief and his wife could not get over their grief. And so the whole village mourned regularly, day after day after day, for months. And one day the chieftainess got up early and she saw a light, bright light, coming from this bed at the back. And she climbed up the ladder and there was a shining youth giving off light. She said, are you my son? He said, yes, come back. So they were quite happy. <laughs> she called her husband, he's back. And they called the village, and the villagers were overjoyed. 
And this shining youth said, heaven was annoyed with your constant grieving, so they sent me back down. <laughs> this chief and his wife had two great slaves, a miserable man and woman, and names were mouth at each end. <laughs> the job of these great slaves, named mouth at each end, was to bring the food into the house. Every day in the morning, they would bring all kinds of food into the house. They would go out early. Typically, they would come back with a big hunk of whale meat, whale fat, and they would throw that fat in the fire, and then they would eat it. And the one odd thing about the boy, the shining prince, was he actually didn't eat very much. Oh, occasionally he would chew on a piece of fat, but then he'd spit it out. And his mother was quite worried about him, because she was afraid if he didn't eat, he would die again. In fact, one day, the father climbed up the ladder and looked in the bed when the shining prince was out for a walk. He looked in the bed, and there was the corpse of his own son. But still, he loved this new boy. But he wouldn't eat, so they were worried about him. So one day when the chief and his wife were away, the shining prince, he got into a conversation with the two great slaves and he mouth at each end. He says, uh, he says, how come you eat all the time? He said, oh, we're hungry all the time. He said, well, do you like to eat? Oh yeah, we like that. Does it taste good what you eat? Oh yeah, we like it to eat. He says, well, why are you hungry all the time? They said, we are hungry because we have eaten the scabs from our shin bones. The boy said, is that, is that good? Oh yeah, we like to eat those scabs. <laughs> he says, well, I'd like to try that. The woman says, no, no, you don't want to try that. Don't eat that. He says, no, I'll just, I, I'll just uh, taste it and spit it out. <coughs> I won't actually eat it. So the man, slave, he takes one of these scabs and he puts it in a piece of whale meat. In a piece of whale meat? Yeah. And the, the youth chews on it a bit and spits it out. After a little while, his mother comes home. He says, Ma, I am ravenous. <laughs> I am very hungry. She's delighted. She says, wonderful. She bakes him this huge meal. He eats the entire meal, puts down his fork. He says, Mother, I am ravenous. <laughs> so she has the slaves make him another huge meal. He eats that meal. He says, I'm still hungry. I make him another meal. So he continues to eat until he has eaten everything in the house. Then he goes out on the street, and he goes from house to house eating everything in each of the houses. And uh, he says, where are the storehouses where you keep the winter stuff? And they say, well, uh, down at the end of this, he says, I want, I'll be down there eating. And uh, <clears throat> the father is kind of upset about this. He is sad and ashamed of this incredible appetite that his boy has. And so he calls him back to the main lodge and he takes him to the back where that bed is and he sits him down and he says, uh, this won't do, this uh, hunger you have. And so I've decided to send you away. You're gonna go to the mainland. And here are three things for you to take with you. One is a blanket made of raven feathers. And you put this on and you will become the raven and be able to fly toward the mainland. And one is a stone. If you get tired as you're flying, just drop that stone. It'll turn into an island and you can go down and rest. And the third is a sea lion bladder. And inside of this is the salmon row and the trout row and the berry seeds. And when you get to the mainland, you throw the salmon row into the rivers and the trout row into the rivers and the berry seeds all over. And for the rest of time, there will be fish in the streams and berries on the bushes so that you'll be able to eat uh, year after year. And so the boy puts on the blanket of raven feathers and he flies to the mainland and he tears open that sea lion bladder and he scatters all those seeds. So this is the beginning of the raven cycle. This is a long, long story. So I don't know, we could, uh, what I wanted to do was <clears throat> kind of chew on this story for a while as if it were a shin scab. And um, these trickster stories are, at one level, they really are about the belly. You know, and if you get too metaphorical about it and say, well, that's my desire to have a pension plan, then you're in some other story. It's really about being a bellied being that has to eat constantly and, and has that problem and has to actually kill animals and fish. And... But then one of trickster's problems sometimes is that he takes things too literally. 
there's a little coyote story in which he's coming along and he sees in the stream some uh, berries and he's hungry and he dives in to get the berries and thunk, he hits his head on the gravel on the bottom and he's unconscious and he floats away dead. And then he, you know, the rabbit jumps over him four times and he comes back and he sees the berries and thunk, he jumps in and of course the berries are up in a tree up above. And he has no idea that you could have an image of something that is not the thing itself. You know, he's incredibly stupid. He doesn't understand about metaphor and symbol. And uh, in fact, in the, in the Winnebago cycle where they tell that story, in, the, in the, almost the next episode, uh, he's trying to eat some raccoons. And the raccoon mothers are around, and they're very worried about the fact that tricksters here are going to eat their children. And he says, oh, uh, you should go about a mile away. There's some fabulous berries. And you'll know the place, because there's a, there's a red sky. And uh, uh, Paul Radin, who has done the, the book on this, says, the red sky in the Winnebago means death is coming. And the raccoon mothers should understand that. But they are stupid and don't know the, me the metaphor. And so right in the story, you see Trickster too stupid to know that there's symbolic life. And two episodes later, he's figured it out, and he's jerking these raccoon mothers around. Yeah. Uh, it's like a joke on them. You'll know the place where there's a red sky. And they, oh, okay, we'll go over the red sky. Meanwhile, he's eating their kids. So, I mean, one of my ideas is that, is that almost out of this problem of appetite comes intelligence about symbolic life. It's like the baited hook. The fish is the literalist who thinks when you see a worm, you have, then, then you have your dinner. But in fact, sometimes a worm has a hook in it. And you have to know that the image is not the same thing as, you know, that there, there could be comp complexity to it. So it works both ways. It really is about food, but also it's not about food. I do think that, that one of the issues is um, that when you're swamped with appetite, there's a kind of stupefying effect. This is a problem with a teenager. <laughs> but for us older guys, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so part of the teaching in this story is therefore you have to you begin to learn to have some distance there is about two and a half feet between the head and the stomach but apparently initially there's no distance between the head and the stomach and so the, the stomach does all your thinking for you I, I was struck by the, uh, the father climbing up to the bed yeah. and finding the carcass yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the mother I had the feeling would never go up there uh -huh. and, and make that, that discovery. But also that he, his hunger for that relationship, he, he accepts, this isn't the son that he wanted, the son yeah. that he wanted. The son he wants won't die. What, what? The son the father wants will not die. And at the beginning of this story, just to say it again quickly, they have this boy that they love a great deal, and the father wants to keep him from all harm and, and washes him. And then he dies, and as part of the funeral, he has the boy's intestines removed. So why don't we, I mean, I, you know, what do you hear in that? It's almost as if he, he doesn't want, even in death, he wants to keep him safe. <laughs> In life, but even in death, he doesn't want a bad hunger. He doesn't want him to go off with yeah, hunger. Yeah, that's good. It's like, I mean, the intestines are about hunger, and so somehow he's removing hunger. Mm -hmm. It also seems like he's taking him out of the cycle of, of real life. Yes. Which is kind of why he was also putting him up high and watching him three times a day. It's like, this is too good to be true. Yeah. And then he doesn't even want him, after death, to have guts to have yeah. intestinal tract, to have any kind of that hunger you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and very good. That's very good. Um, Plus, if you want to, you know, when, when you hunt it, if you want to preserve the, the carcass of the animal, first thing you do is take the guts out. Mm -hmm. so oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you gut the animal, you carry the meat home and eat it. Who eats the intestines? Raven does. I think the scavengers come. The scavenger, the raven, always first time he hits the carcass, he's intestines. It's famous for people. We have a lot of story about it. <coughs> Does the wolves know they see the ravens? Yeah. They follow them. They can see from the air. That's fabulous. <laughs> I hadn't Coyotes seen do that too. Uh, yeah. His spiritual son will come back and have any hunger for his guts and stuff. That's right. So you see, in a way, that when the kid comes back, 
uh, he is the fruit of this. There's been a sacrifice of appetite. Yeah. And the kid has no appetite. It sounds like, uh, you know, the morning, and this is going to be a stretch, but it, it reminds me of Christianity because, uh, you know, the morning of, of the loss of death, and then here comes this this person back to this world who has no appetite, yeah. uh, who's yeah. somehow above the world in yeah. terms of appetite. And yeah. It reminds me of Christ in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Father started out wanting to keep the son safe, so yeah. he kept him removed. But it's almost once the son really comes into the world, gets his appetite, then eventually the father has to turn him out. Well, the, yeah, the father. I mean, he just dies in the in the story. Um, he just dies, and uh, and then the father guts him. That's true, <laughs> but let me. I, I want to go on to these slaves, but let me let me say one thing that in sort of. Another term I use for this is that the father uh, has a kind of idealism. And one thing about the trickster stories is that these trickster figures are profoundly anti-ideal. They really are in this world. They suffer the way we suffer, and they're hungry the way we're hungry, and they fuck up. But there's great humor, and so forth and so on. And that, just that sentence to say he wanted to keep his son from all harm, there's tremendous human longing in that to uh, have a perf more perfected world in which your children will not suffer. And I thought of it last night, all these stories about adolescence, you know, you can read them both ways, that these older people are keeping you down or something, but I also hear in it <coughs> the parents longing for the child. It's like the, ch the parents are saying, you know, this is a very difficult and harmful world, and if, if you don't have a profession that can feed you and, and so forth, you're gonna be in trouble, and I want you, or, you know, maybe it's the parents' unlived life, I wanted that, and so I want you. Anyway, there's an idealism at the beginning of this story where the father wants the son to be free of all harm. But that also means, you know, it's an otherworldly, it's a hopeless desire. You know, to be an embodied creature that eats is also to be mortal. It's to be in the changeable world where harm will come to your children and to you. And, and when he cuts the kid's guts out, it's as if he's trying to remove him from this mutable world where we have to eat and die. Or another part of the parent's job is to leave the kids alone, is when the child is doing something risky. I mean, for me as a parent, that was one of the most difficult things. My, my image of the parent of the adolescent is that you are completely responsible and completely powerless. So you see your kid go out and take risks, and you have to not intervene. That's very difficult, uh, because in fact, your child will be hurt and could die. Yeah. And to sit back, and let the child take the risk that could kill him is, is difficult. And this father doesn't do that. This father has that idealist impulse. But l let me ask, how do you see these um, slaves? And what does it mean to say mouth at each end? Who are they? And what is that about? The intestines. Both ends are down. Exactly. You know, the body. To be embodied is to have this interior slave that uh, is hungry all the time and eats for you and brings the food in and digests it and uh, keeps you alive. So that, you know, they are in this story too. The parents have those slaves. So in a sense, the story is about a battle. Who is going to own this child? The father who has this sense of purity and would like to protect him or the slaves or the intestines or maybe not even a battle, but the, the boy comes back and he is then in that situation where he could go either way. You know, to be the child of these parents and to also be in touch with the slaves uh, is to begin to be in this world fully. Actually, let me tell you one image, which is in this Winnebago trickster cycle. The trickster figure at the beginning looks monstrous, and, and the way he looks is he has his intestines wrapped all around his body, and he has his penis, there's a huge penis on a, in a box on his back. <laughs> yeah, and he, he can send it in a big lake like this. The chief's daughters are bathing over on the far shore. He can send his penis under the water, stick it up into the chief's daughter. <laughs> But that's, that's a beautiful image of being swamped by hunger and sex. And that isn't this world either yet, you know. And, and what happens in that story is his intestines get reduced to this size. And his penis, he, <laughs> he gets angry at a chipmunk, sticks his dick into a, into a hollow log to try to beat up this chipmunk. And the chipmunk just eats all his dick. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and, and it comes out human-sized. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, and all the little, 
And he's very un unhappy about all, he has, you know, it ends up there are all these pieces of his dick and his intestines lying around, and he makes these into food for human beings. And I love that detail because it, what it means is every time you eat, you are eating trickster's guts and, and, and dick. And it means that you will be hungry and horny because that's in, it's in, you know, it's in the food. And uh, the only, you know, the only way you could get away from that is to just stop eating and try to become this prince, but that's hopeless too. So, so <laughs> I don't know where we were, but uh, yeah. In a way, Raven is a, is a celestial being and yet is hungry. And so he is an image of an idealism that has a belly. And again, it's, it's as if what one wants is for the body to have right relationships. So the, the parts of the body, your stomach is not at odds with your head and not at odds with your dick and not at odds uh, with your spirit and so forth. And somehow begins to be you know, tuned and uh, lively. And all these stories of eating and the trickster figure in eating is somehow about where does the meat go? Where, where does the, the stuff of hunger go? And how, how do we relate to it? And uh, how do we get it to the proper size? Did the appetites win? The appetites win. Yeah. Though, you know, he chooses in a sense. You know, it's like the, these stories of anorexic teenagers who have a sense that they are entering a mutable world that they have no control over. Mm -hmm. And the only way to take control is to quit eating. Mm -hmm. And this is the anorexic prince mm -hmm. uh, who's managed to uh, become a shining, uh, perfected being by not eating. So he's out of the game entirely. But, th but then, it's like a little seed of appetite or something, or curiosity. So what are the scabs? What are the scabs? So, so instead of being fingernails or, or something, why is it scabs? When I think of um, a person eating you know, the scabs off the slave sins, I think of the chains that could have been around the slave yeah. sins. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. you get off into the, uh, the economic reasons of <coughs> slaves and how See. people yeah. This is very good. Yeah. This is very good. You see, the whole thing that no one is talking about here that is uh, rather uh, astounding when I think about it, in the land of plenty, is just that nobody here is thinking of themselves as wounders, as killers and wounders. All of the initiations of young men and young women in the village are based on the fact that they realize that they're decapitating food every day to fill the appetites of the village. The fact that the slave is the one that has been wounded in the pursuit of the food, and that, uh, and that the king's son has to eat this wound in order to get his appetite. You see, it's the idea that you're destroying your food. When you get initiated, when you finally dream that you're eating your little brother or you're eating your father boiling in a pot like a cannibal, then you're finally getting an initiatory dream because you realize that, that piece of lettuce or that turkey or that fish that you're eating is the same being as your people. All right, so the wounding you see, nature of things is that you have to feed what you wound. In other words, you're feeding the same body that you're killing constantly. It's like eating your own tail all the time. And the tail keeps trying to heal itself. Does it heal enough for it to keep filling you every day? All right, and America has no idea, you see. But uh, the point in, in, in the story here is so magnificent. It's because the, the appetite doesn't begin until the wound is eaten. To the, the wound that is attempted to be healed is eaten, and then it opens the wound again, right. which has to be healed by the food that is being eaten, and, and plus interest. The whale, the whale fat. Interest. That's wonderful. wonderful. You see what I mean? <clears throat> One thing that's in a lot of these stories is that um, before Trickster came along, the world was a better place, in which uh, you would wake up in the morning, and outside the tent there would be a hot bowl of acorn mush, and um, that, uh, or you could work for one day and get enough food for a year. And sure. so there was some kind of golden age in which food was not a problem. And then connected to tricksters screwing up is, uh, it's the old story, is the fact that we have to work hard to get our food. And these slaves, you know, I read the scabs on their shins exactly that. There's some sort of hard labor going on in this world. They have to do it to get the food. And, and so, you know, it's like there's a circle of appetite and hard labor, and uh, to eat these scabs is to enter into it. And, and the way Martini imagines it is, is wonderful. I also wondered some in, in this story, if a scab comes after a wound, the Shining Prince, so has the Shining Prince been wounded? Well, the father had his intestines cut out. And so if these, if these mouth at each end are intestines, no wonder, I mean, they're scabby, because they, they were cut out of his body. And there's some kind of returning um, to begin to eat 
the scabs on his own intestines, <coughs> would be another way to say it, is to come back into this world. So he's been wounded by some sort of idealism, and the wound is scabbed over, and, and to begin to eat the scab, there's some reclaiming of those intestines and coming back to them. So that, and, and then at the end, of course, he's hungry constantly. But you could say that asceticism of Christianity in the Middle Ages was uh, refusing all this hunger. And yeah. then it comes back to now where we're eating the whole globe. <laughs> I mean, that's eating the, the same turn again. Mm. Well, that's why I use this term, right, some kind of right relationship to hunger. You cannot get away from hunger. I mean, this is the Buddhist idea. You know, the Buddha tried an ascetic path and starved himself for 10 or 15 years and didn't work. So then he quit that. You know, you don't want to either be a glutton or an ascetic. There's some sort of, to be a human being is to, is to eat in some appropriate manner. I think in, these, in the trickster stories, it's as if there is a complicated eating game going on of one thing eating another. Mm -hmm. Everything eats everything else. And <clears throat> when I say the trickster has an intelligence about making a trap to eat something else, but then also is stupid in some situations and gets trapped and devoured, it's as if every, every living being is simultaneously an eater who's able, has the cunning to eat something else and a prey who has, who's too stupid and gets eaten by something else. And one impulse is to try to get out of the eating game entirely, which is, the, I think, the father's impulse in this. If we could just get rid of the intestines, we could step out of this eating game and uh, stop suffering. But in this story, at least, that turns out to be an impossible solution. I think maybe we should take a break. You know, this story will be with us for the whole weekend. Uh, there'll be other things that come up. Thank you very much. Yeah.